three, two, one. Well, you've got the horizontal plane and you've got the vertical plane. About one o'clock, left leg down, right knee up. Here we go. fun learning the art of precision play paddling. You'll improve your skills and confidence and develop more enjoyment of waves, holes, and the play potential of the river. This advanced play boating is not just for a few experts. Any paddler with the desire to learn can master the fundamentals. In Rotendo, we'll look at some advanced tips for surfing, side surfing, and catching air with moves like enders, pirouettes, and squirt turns. By combining some of the fundamentals of these moves, you can learn to link cartwheels in a hole and have even more fun on the river. This video addresses advanced skills, often skipping basics that could help your paddling. Check out some other videos and get some lessons to expand your knowledge of technique and safety. By building on basic skills, nearly everyone can improve their enjoyment of the river. Improved technique leads to longer, more dynamic surfs, more controlled side surfs, and more predictable airtime. While some play paddling moves can be done in almost any boat, moves like squirt turns, blasting, and cartwheels will be noticeably easier with a specialized play design. With these boats, you'll have more fun with small river features. Exceptional surfing ability is big fun. Plus, it's a prerequisite to advanced moves. But, if you're like most paddlers, your surfing probably has room for improvement. How often do you fall off a wave without a good long ride? These tips will help you get longer, more predictable surfs. Strategy on entering a wave is key. Because many waves are big enough you can just float out there and start paddling upstream and hopefully you pick up the wave. But you may get away with that strategy sometimes, but if you're going to surf the hard waves, there is a sound strategy to get on them. And you ought to start practicing them on the easy waves so you get in the right habit. The right habits start with getting onto the wave, a move which can often be quite tricky. Missed surfs are usually caused by aiming for the wrong spot or by ineffective boat control. Let's study surfing from the easiest approach, when the wave is next to the eddy. A common problem is paddling real hard on exiting the eddy, whether or not it's the right path. Without precise aim, you'll run up on the back of the oncoming water. Then your momentum slides you back and off the wave. It's better to slide out onto the wave, even if you don't have an eddy to work from. Many people get lured into looking at their destination out on the wave, rather than paying enough attention to their bow and their angle with the current. You have to deal with an intermediate target where the wave meets the eddy line. Here's a good example of where to aim to slide out onto a wave. You want to aim the bow water line of your boat for between where the trough of the wave hits the eddy line and where the shoulder hits the eddy line. If you come out on the shoulder, you want to carry a lot of speed 
If you come out at the trough, you'll want to side slip. You probably are accustomed to getting on waves by the low approach with speed and a rudder. But if you can side slip gracefully, then you can slide onto waves from a wide variety of positions in the eddy. A rudder will usually work to side slip out onto a wave unless you don't have enough speed or the right positioning. Side slipping draws help avoid this problem. Plus, you won't have to rely on a ruddering stroke that's placed on the swirls of the eddy line. The side slip move looks easy, but it's not. A prerequisite skill is sculling to move the boat sideways. Sculling will help you maneuver at slow speeds and develop blade finesse. Feather the blade along a two-foot line six inches from your boat. Gradually open the blade for each direction of travel, making sure to keep both of your hands out over the water. Now try the shift to slide sideways while underway. Get up some speed and place a stationary draw stroke right behind the pivot point of the boat. With the right blade angle and placement, you'll move sideways smoothly. If the blade is too far forward, you'll simply turn. Some of the best paddlers can even use this sort of stroke in reverse. Now let's look at some precision strokes that'll help tune up your surfing. Exactly how you steer on a surf is critical because it affects your position on the wave, not only from side to side, but also upstream and downstream. Control your position by adjusting the amount of turning effect and the amount of drag created by your paddle. Okay, when people first start out surfing, they're at one level, and they'll wedge in a pry on this side, and they'll bring the boat back. They start going off the other way, and they'll wedge in something else and bring it back. And surfing's that basic. But as waves get more complicated, then they have a hard time staying on. If you really want to shred up a wave, if you want to be able to shred any complex wave with a lot of speed that changes on you, you have to move into a, a new dimension, and it's really simple. So imagine I twist my torso way to the side, and as I surf, I can kick the edge in, articulate my hips, and push the tail that way, which brings the bow flying back to that angle. And I'm controlling the boat. Look at us with these muscles inside. Wedging rudders have a large braking component, which works well on steep waves. But wedging rudders are detrimental on small waves, since too much drag can pull the boat off. As a result, to have the best rides, you'll want streamlined, no-drag rudders, combined with the power of the lower body. And this is how to get the feel of using those deep muscles. If you twist completely towards me, now engaging your hip and your obliques, push that tail away, now pull, and quiet the upper body one more time, perfect, pull it in. Does that feel like it out in the water? It does. And you feel it down here in the big muscles, it's quiet up here. Great. Let's look closely at the position of the blade. Rotate your torso way around, drop your elbow down, and extend your front arm across and high. Keeping the top hand above eye level puts the blade deep in the water and at the correct angle to have the strongest effect. Many people don't know this precise no-drag rudder. Instead, they have the blade flat on the water or use an inadvertent braking stroke. Paddle forward to simulate the feel of current. Keep a lot of torso twist and keep your front arm extended. If your top arm pulls on the shaft, you've just turned the rudder into a braking stroke. The stern draw pulling motion is much more difficult, so really exaggerate this part with your lower body. Here's how you can get even more precision and power with your surfing. It's with stationary strokes. What I'm going to do is drop the blade in and then change the angle very subtly to feel a little bit more pressure to turn. Then to move the other direction, I can change the blade angle to get pressure on this face of the blade to turn the other direction. Work on making this motion very subtle by feeling for the current on alternate faces of the blade. To do this, you'll not actually be pulling on the shaft. Instead, twist the blade to feel pressure on one side to move one way, and on the other face to move the other way. 
The more you can control the boat from just one side, the more options you'll have when surfing on stronger, more complex waves. When you are surfing, you'll often be working to keep the bow of the boat from burying. Knowing a few tricks can mean the difference between maintaining a dynamic surf and getting blown off the wave. Leaning back will help keep the bow up. Move around on the wave to find a part of the wave that won't force the bow to bury. On steep waves, your first line of defense is those breaking rudder strokes. You know, the wedging ones that we don't want you to do all of the time. But if the bow buries in the oncoming current, tilt the boat by lifting one knee. Tilting the boat sheds the water off the deck and pops the bow back up to the surface. Practice letting the nose bury, then bringing it to the surface and recovering your surf. On some waves, you may need a steady shaking motion to constantly shed the water that's loading up on the bow. Which way do you lean to turn? It depends on the boat design, the wave, and whether you want to slice the stern in, carve, or counterbalance a stroke. So there's no one answer. It's fun to experiment, and the only wrong lean is an abrupt one or a wobble. If you feel yourself sliding backwards off the wave, hit an aggressive forward lean in a series of lightning fast forward strokes. Interestingly, the forward stroke for front surfing differs from what you'll use in normal river running. The stroke you use to pick up a high speed surfing wave indeed is different than the stroke that you use everywhere else on the river. This stroke is different because the water's flying by you at such a high speed already. And when you go to engage the water, you have to have that paddle moving through the air at least as quick as the water when it catches. And therefore, the stroke's a little farther back, way quicker, and it's way shorter. As you play with your surfing, keep in mind that nearly all the best paddlers have this rudder style. Keeping your torso rotated and your back elbow twisted down helps ensure you have the correct blade angle. There must be something to it. Back surfing can have a punishing learning curve, but it is one of the easiest ways to develop skills very important for more advanced moves. Controlled 360 spins and retendos both require a high degree of proficiency in back surf type awareness. The best way to work it is with progressively bigger waves. Pay special attention to your visual landmarks. Watch the current running downstream of your boat to help sense the boat angle. Also, you can learn to turn and look upstream at your stern. You'll want to learn two control strokes so you can control the surf from on each side. The rudder with both hands low and the bow draw. Both of these work best as stationary strokes, using the current against the blade to provide the force. Few paddlers use the draw effectively but those who do can use it for additional precision and therefore greater reliability in more difficult moves. For back surfing, I think the hardest part is actually getting on the wave as opposed to staying on the wave once you're there. And the real key there, again, is to stay close to the eddy line like when you're going on a forward surf and to keep on pushing and jumping over the eddy line backwards as opposed to what a lot of folks do, which is just get to the eddy line and try and rudder their way out there with no power at all. like to catch air more reliably, there's some good tricks worth learning. Finding the sweet spot is the first key to getting vertical. Study the paddlers getting the best air for clues. Examine the grain of the current for where it is strongest and deepest 
then drive into this spot with your boat perpendicular. And the one element that really ices the cake on this is the pitch of the kayak. Sometimes the water will be sliding around that rock in such a way that to be perpendicular to that water, you need to pitch your boat up slightly, exposing the deck of your kayak at a right angle to that water, and then you feel the full power of the load push the bow right down. To reliably catch the full force of the current, you'll learn to sense water pressure on the deck of your boat, just as you sense different pressures with your blade. Many paddlers take rough aim for the sweet spot, then lean forward and passively wait for good air. If you just let it go, the bow will probably find a way to shift off center. With an ender, I, it's amazing uh, how many times you can miss an ender when you think you're lined up for it. It's, while we all say it's a pretty easy trick these days, we can still blow it. And the reason that we blow it is sometimes we let the bow shank off the water before it dives down one way or the other. To keep the boat on target, Fine-tune the bow's positioning by keeping your blade in the water. For holes and steep waves, you will probably use a braking control stroke by your hip. For pour-overs, you'll use a stern rudder or stern draw. When you're positioning for pour-over vertical moves, it's handy to be able to move sideways with a mix of speed and precision. One option is using your rudder which can be modified to provide a bit of side slipping. An alternative is the stroke work that lets you draw sideways with speed. The best paddlers have both styles mastered. This gives them more options for keeping the boat perpendicular to the sweet spot. Even if you don't have the bow lined up perfectly, or if the current is weak, you can often encourage it down by leaning forward. Don't be afraid to feel pressure on your feet. Tucking forward will help the bow engage, while leaning back delays the entering reaction. Learning to will it down will help you milk airtime from smaller water features. you can get to that ender, it just leads right in to your first pirouette with kicking that stern draw out. And all it, simply you just control your boat in, into the sweet spot, angle it, pitch it, start to go vertical, and as you're standing up on your footrest, your paddle's already in the perfect position. You've got the water there, you just unwind as you stand up and lean against your back deck of your boat and turn and look and twist and you start pirouetting around. Use a short, powerful reverse sweep across your bow, combined with an aggressive twist of your head and shoulders. This forces the boat into more rotation. There is one other, more advanced stroke sequence that works to pirouette. It's using a cross draw. Generally, you will cross draw at an eddy line, reaching out to grab the main force of the current. The cross draw also works well to maintain a spin. With a small boat, Squirt turns can take you vertical without the help of much current. Even if you can already do a squirt, practice this drill to help improve your whitewater edging and balance. Peel out into a small jet of current, keeping your boat flat and your paddle completely out of the action. Without the blade in the water, you'll develop better sensitivity to the water pressure on your deck. Once you've developed that feel, use it to initiate the load on the back deck before you begin your reverse sweep. This saves the stroke for driving the boat further under and controlling the spin. Once you've mastered the load, then stroke sequence, try turning the reverse sweep into a bow draw. This helps you control a good pivot without bringing your weight forward and killing the move. If you start the move by setting your edge suddenly, it's less likely to slice under smoothly. Also, try to start the squirt from a charging arc or veer rather than from a straight line approach. This will help you initiate the move. Keep in mind these moves do depend quite a bit on your weight and the size and shape of your boat. Once you're up on end, you can practice vertical balance. Practice in flat water. A little water in the end of your boat 
might help you bobble around. This end balance will help you spin pirouettes and aim multiple end cartwheels. Precise edge and balance control is important, even when you aren't on end, so fine tune your boat tilt. Edge the boat slightly by shifting more of your weight onto one butt cheek. For a little more edge, shift more of your weight over. One way to think of this boat tilt is by moving your rib cage out to the side, leaving your head centered over the boat, and fine tuning the edging with this knee. Practice some forward strokes to get accustomed to using the blade while in this balanced position. No wobbles, side surfs, and more advanced moves will require this sort of steady edging. There's reasons people are scared to go into the hole because if you don't know what to do, you're going to get spanked or slapped around a little bit. But if you tell him the right thing to do, he could be doing it. It's not hard. Let's study a friendly side surf hole so you can get the most from this river feature. The water rushing into the hole is usually called the green water. Lots of this water goes deep and directly downstream while some curls back upstream to create a frothy foam pile. This backwash builds up speed and power as it falls into the crease. The top of the pile acts as an eddy, providing a momentary place to reposition and set up moves. To stay upright in a side surf, you must keep the upstream edge of your boat clear of the green water falling into the hull. If this edge catches, it's an instant flip. So how much boat tilt do you want? Well, you definitely want enough tilt to keep the upstream edge from catching, but not one degree more. The amount of tilt you need depends on where you are in the hole. If you are settled down deep in the trough of the hole, at the crease, you'll need a fair amount of boat edging. Sitting on top, you'll be able to sit flat with hardly any boat tilt at all. Different points in between will need different amounts of boat tilt. It sounds crazy, but one of the easiest ways to find the balance position is to hand surf. You can reach your hand deep to feel support from the current underneath. Trying it is a gut check, but pays excellent rewards in confidence. Your main side surf position will be in the low brace, using the back of the blade with your elbows over your wrists. This blade position can help reduce excessive bouncing in the hole. If it's difficult for you to ride a low brace, it's a clear indication that you don't have the correct body position over your boat. At times, you'll use the high brace with elbows bent and in close to your body to protect your shoulders. Stay forward to find the most balanced, flat position. Leaning back will make you feel unstable. Either brace should only be used for momentary support to regain your balance. If you flip upstream, don't brace. Roll instead to avoid a shoulder injury or broken paddle. If you tilt the boat too far downstream, you'll look to the blade for constant support, then you won't be able to maneuver effectively. From an ideal, balanced position, you can use normal forward or reverse strokes to move your boat. Okay. <laughs> I haven't said anything yet. In this hole, I need to sit flat, I need to sit look straight, and I may use forward strokes to move in one direction, our reverse strokes to move in the other. Practice paddling with your boat tilted up so you'll have the balance to maneuver with good power. Few paddlers have it mastered, but stroking on both sides will help you move more assertively. If you don't have enough balance for pure forward or reverse strokes, you can sacrifice power and incorporate a brace. The high brace combines easily with a small forward sweep to propel you forward. The low brace works nicely with the reverse sweep to move you the other direction. You've got one more stroke option for moving around in a hole. Stationary strokes. These take advantage of the current under the pile to pressure the blade. Angle the paddle in this high brace forward sweep position to move forward in the hole. This modified low brace lets the back of the blade catch the water and push your boat reverse. 
Side surfing is fun. But it's difficult to do more advanced moves from a position settled down in the crease. Instead, maneuver your way towards the top of the pile. You'll need to master this repositioning to spin or to initiate any advanced move. The easiest route to the top of the pile is at the corner, just as you're about to be released from the hole, but before you wash downstream. You'll need to precisely control your speed to not go past this release point. A light touch on quick correction strokes may be needed to dial in the exact position. From this corner position, work your way to the flat area on top of the pile. From here, you can move around more easily and engage some nice moves. The strength and shape of each hole is different, so it's useful to have a bag of tricks for getting on top. For instance, you can occasionally take advantage of bounces that land you further up on the pile. Blasting is a more predictable way to move around. You'll need to slice under the pile for a dynamic surf or fast change of direction. You'll find it easiest if you commit the blade in with the front hand high. That water is moving by real fast, so without a perfect stroke and counterbalance, the water will torque the shaft in your grip or flip you. From a blast, you can often ferry out of the hole, then ferry back on top of the pile, or somewhere in between the crease and the top. This is a precise way to reset your boat position. Another way is to start the boat blasting and then fall off to build downstream momentum. This allows you to break through some of the backwash to move closer to on top of the pile. The 360s help you learn the boundaries, power, and other characteristics of a hole. Work your way to the corner as you would on an exit, but with controlled speed so you don't go past the release point. As the bow enters the downstream current, let it spin until it's almost parallel with the grain of the current. Look over your shoulder at the stern until it clears the green water. To help continue the boat spin, use draws or sweeps. The moment the stern is clear, change the tilt, swap blades, look over the opposite shoulder to the same point near the crease in green water. Then watch the bow as it swings clear of the green water. Your head movement helps position your shoulders and torso to lead the boat into more spin. You'll find this habit useful in cartwheels. Don't run blind, lead with your head. The bow draw has particular advantages for making the spin succeed helps turn the kayak while delaying the stern from sliding back in the hole. You'll discover some spin corners don't work with sweeps. Often you'll need reverse strokes to move upstream. Notice how the reverse strokes that control your boat angles are the same as the back surf strokes we learned earlier. Concentrate on feeling how the water does the work. The more comfortable you are with 360s in each direction, the more confident you will be working the advanced moves. Here's a look into the future. Boat designs open the door for a different type of 360, called flat spins. You'll need a super sensitivity to ride a flat boat and a keen awareness to keep your body quiet. This way neither end will engage the current and blow you off the wave. The early Rotendos were unintentional, and as the sport progressed, paddlers realized that anything done once by accident could be duplicated on purpose for fun. Wow, when you spiral your boat in, when you put your boat in for the endo, and if you turn it up on edge, good things will happen.
Didn't even know what it was yet, but you knew you'd come back into the hole. From analyzing the moves, paddlers discovered that presenting the side profile of the boat released the downstream pressure and greatly improved the odds for staying in the hole. You can see the profile there is narrow for the water to go by. That's gonna, water will rush by that a lot easier than it will rush by that. When it hits that, it's gonna flush, it's gonna have a tendency to move downstream. So you catch the water with the bow of the boat, the bow is driven down, and as you're spiraling your hips, spiraling the boat to the profile shape exposed to the current, it releases that pressure that pushes the boat out the hole, and you come right back in for a good retendo. State-of-the-art playboat designs enhance this profile, taking the best of squirt boats, which slice into vertical easily, and creek boats, which provide cockpit volume for comfortable side surfs and stability. To learn how these moves work, first we will study systems for initiating vertical cartwheels. Then we'll study strokes, body positioning, and vision patterns, which are the principles to learning and then linking vertical moves. We're going to use this model boat to show you the movement the boat goes through when we're playing in holes in the vertical dimension. A fundamental principle of retentive moves is the catch and release. In this, the kayaker loads the bow sending the kayak vertical and spins the kayak, releasing that continued downstream pressure. This allows the kayaker to fall back into the hole. The catch and release requires driving in straight to the sweet spot, and therefore has a narrow window of opportunity to bring the boat up to vertical. This is especially true in larger holes and complex currents. So let's take a look at a different way to initiate vertical moves and set up multiple end cartwheels. An important principle for linked vertical moves is the overshoot theory, whereupon the kayaker catches the green water at one o'clock, slicing the bow towards 12 o'clock in the release position where the stern is ready for the next vertical move. We'll frequently use a clock face to describe the angle of the boat relative to the upstream current. Straight up into the grain of the current is always 12 o'clock. It's important to note that every position in the hull can have its own clock reference. Instead of loading and then releasing while pointed to 12 o'clock with a catch and release, in overshoot you slice on edge into 12 and vertical at the center of the clock. Some paddlers call this overshoot because you will often take the bow past the sweet spot at 12 and slice the bow back into the green water at 11 o'clock, edging it in until it reaches vertical. Overshooting the sweet spot helps you wind up to create momentum, like cracking a whip. This action generates considerable momentum in the direction the bow needs to go, even before the water loads on it. Here's a different way to look at it. The bow gets a running start before it engages at 11. This approach blends the loading and releasing into one smooth motion through the sweet spot. You control the boat's angle of attack with your edging. If you engage around 1 o'clock, the same principles apply, but you work off the opposite blade and edging. You don't have to approach from the side to get the overshoot. From almost anywhere along a hole, you can overshoot and slice the momentum of a spin into the vertical realm. With the overshoot principle, the initiation of your first end relies on total commitment to this key stroke. It turns the boat, helps establish the edging, and starts the bow slicing in. The same stroke helps keep the bow from engaging too much. People ask, they say, what are you doing on your right side? Is that a backstroke? It's not really a backstroke. What it is is, it's, I think of it as the break. It, it's gonna... People often think the initiation is done with a reverse stroke. But watch closely, it's actually a break or control stroke. The break allows your lower body to do the work. The purpose of this drill is to get the feel of using the correct muscles when initiating the vertical moves. When you place that paddle out there, we're not just using our arms and torso, but we're driving the legs towards the paddle, closing the scissors. Closing the scissors provides the power to edge your bow under, a little bit like shown in this flat water drill. An overshoot initiation at 11 o'clock works with the right blade control stroke 
and the left knee up for edging. To initiate it one, it's left blade down, right knee up. A common mistake people make trying to initiate the bow is they lean back and use a rudder. If you lean back as in a front surf, it's hard to initiate the bow. Instead, you should be in an upright, slightly forward posture and use a braking stroke out to the side. It's a little tricky to maintain balance and make the stroke work in foamy, turbulent water. Be careful not to lean on the blade. It can't be a brace. It's just that tendency that any time a blade goes down the water, it's nice to put a little more weight on it than you need. And you don't need to weight that blade any more than what you need to control your bow. And it's, that's, that's the gray area that's hard to understand. It's, you know, how, much, how much pressure do you put? Each stroke plays one more important role. That's holding the boat back. Too much penetration is no good for retentive moves. It drives the bow into the downstream current flowing underneath the pile and out of the hole. Your stroke controls how much or how deep the bow engages. If you are working off the top of a tall pile, you may have to use small reverse strokes to walk the boat down, since dropping in from the top would drive you in too deep. Bow at one o'clock. Left blade down, right knee up. Here we go. Once you can initiate one vertical move, you'll be eager to link several ends. Or doing vertical maneuvers or just generally surfing waves or whatever, it's really nice to keep your upper body as quiet as you can and let the boat do the carving or let the boat do the rotating around you. This is a key principle. Keep the motions of your upper body subtle. By using your lower body to power the stroke, you keep your upper body quiet. As in enders and pirouettes, the, the, big, the big push, body twist was great, but in retentive moves, you don't need it. It's, it's not only gr not great, it's bad. It's, it's extra momentum that you have to deal with as you try to come back down to the hole. You only want enough head and torso motion to engage the ends and maintain balance. In the disorienting world of cartwheels, it's good to have a clear system for maintaining balance on edge. One way is to learn how your torso relates with the cockpit area. This might look like an extreme position, but you'll need this curled up position to stay in balance if you're on this sort of edge. Practice which knee holds the balance to improve your strength and flexibility. If you're driving with the back of your boat, it can be in a cartwheel, it can be in a back surf, it can be, any, it can be running rapid backwards. If you're driving with a different end other than the bow, you should be looking over your shoulder. It's not enough to sneak a peek over your shoulder. Lead your moves with your head and eyes so you can follow each end around and see your reference points. Look with your eyes and lead with your head. And the reason I say look with your eyes is I actually see people kind of leading with things, but I've, I've looked in their eyes and they're just, they're looking the wrong way. So you physically want to watch each end of your boat with your, with your eyes and you always want to lead the move with your head. So as you, you, you're trying to focus in on the foam pile and the green water, and the green water where it meets the bottom of the foam pile at the bottom of the hole. Those two things are pretty key in, in initiating your moves and staying in the hole. While you're airborne, try to keep your head and shoulders centered over the crease between the pile and the green water. You want to land in a spot that captures you in the hole. The further you move away from this capture zone, the lower your odds of landing a retentive move. With good visual landmarks, you'll know when to use forward or reverse strokes to reposition on the pile. Mark, a lot of my students are starting to do this stuff, but they're running blind, you know, they're not using the head. Right. And, and they're doing it so they're stoked. But I'm saying we need to activate this head, head action even on the flat spin and the, the early cartwheels so it leads them to doing these multiple ends. Right. You, you can run blind for the first couple. Okay. And you can, through repetition and running blind, you can stumble your way onto you know, three or four ends eventually. But if you can get the basic principles down that we've been talking about, and you can get those going, you're gonna start really nailing your two end cartwheels, and you're gonna be on your way to your third, fourth, 20th end a lot faster.
it is so much easier than you think once when someone gives you the directions of what to do because it's not real intuitive you look at it and you go god how did he do that because the process of going up for a big ender and then coming down and watching your tail go right under again that looks difficult if you haven't done it it seems impossible but it's not and you'd be shocked at how easy it is when you do it and you go whoa i can't believe it you're high the whole rest of the day just doing your first one one of the best places to learn and apply the feel of hitting multiple ends is at a small pour over or ledge rather than at a hole. By working your way up the eddy behind a pour over, you get a little more time to set up and recover. It's a perfect place to learn. Glide in slowly and feel for pressure loading up on the bow, engaging only as much current as you need. Will it down if you need a little more load on the deck. Your stroke power and timing determines your positioning. Too much power early or before the bow is fully loaded may push you downstream. An overpowered late stroke can send you upstream too far. Don't despair, it might take quite a few tries to get the timing and positioning just right. Remember the drills for balancing on end? Developing solid balance will naturally improve your body position and give you more time to aim the next end. The drills for balancing on edge can help you avoid the common problem of landing off center. If you land off balance, you're forced to use your paddle as a brace and you won't be able to keep your body quiet or set up the proper stroke in time for the next move. Once you've got the moves happening off a pour over or small ledge, you'll want to try in a hole. The hardest part of initiating these moves will be finding a strategy for getting up out of the crease closer to the top of the pile. You'll often find it easiest to initiate on your entry to the hole. Now let's look a little closer at the follow through for hitting your third, fifth, and multiple ends. It goes pretty fast working strokes to engage each end as it comes around. But while you guide each end through, it's important to keep your front to back movement in this range. Don't let your body motion get extreme like this. Minimizing your body movement and timing your strokes is a critical part of hitting your third end, which is where a lot of people have trouble. The stern of your boat is small and slices through the pile easily. So if you're too far back, it's easy to get stuck on the stroke for bracing. You'll either wash out, hung up on your stern, or the bow smashes down unweighted because you're out of balance. You got your kayak, you got your bow, and then you've got your, your stern. And you got this, you want to have your body in this upright neutral position. And anytime you want to initiate the bow, you come to the slightly positive position. Anytime you want to initiate the stern, you come to the slightly negative position. And realize that if you start making huge body ch changes, you go positive, and then have to throw the stern, you have to come this big negative, positive, negative, you start making these huge body gyrations, the boat eventually outrun you. If you're too far back or too far forward for any one end, you'll miss the strokes to bring the next end through. As soon as you see one end hit, you're done with it. So get off your stroke and lead around with your head to get to the other end. It doesn't matter which side, a cartwheel goes push, pull, push, pull. So I'm not sure everybody realizes that. So as you, as you push, and once again, the push is not a reverse stroke. It's just a controlled stroke that lets you know when and where your bow is going to initiate. And then as your bow comes through the water, and then as your stern starts to fall through, you're watching it. When you watch it hit, you reach and you pull. Then the, and you've got gravity helping you. The stern comes through, and then once the stern come, comes through, you're going to immediately get off of that end and get to the bow for your third end. Keep checking on your reference points in the hole. As you start hitting multiples, you'll find that the boat has a tendency to wander out of the hole. You, you kind of catwalk. As you start linking ends, there tends to be this lateral movement to catwalk. And you have to, you have, I, I just like catwalk, you know, when you catwalk a, a refrigerator or something like that. And that's, that's essentially what's happening because you're, rarely are you perfectly vertical and able to hit in the exact same spot. There'll be a little bit, you'll be a little past or not quite. And when you hit that, as you keep hitting at different angles, you kind of move laterally. It takes good visual awareness combined with an intuitive feel to make an adjustment in time. You either have to 
readjust your positioning when you're vertical to try to push back into the hole. And a lot of times you can do that by, as you're going vertical, shoving in one direction to take you in the opposite direction. And the other things are just to kill the move and flatten out. So right as you're coming around, as your bow or stern comes around, rather than going for the next end, you just flatten out and then, then shove yourself back in the hole or pull yourself back in the hole. Working on retentive moves, quick rolls will help you avoid washing out when you flip. You'll almost always go with the momentum of the flip for the quickest roll. But if you get disoriented, you can feel for pressure on the blade to know which side will roll most easily. To make them quick, you'll need to have solid rolls on both sides. The traditional kayak roll, whether C to C or sweep, can take too long if you have to reposition from the back deck to the front deck setup. Hanging out under the boat gives the current more to push on, so you're more likely to get flushed out of the hole. Aerial moves often end with your body leaning back. The rodeo roll allows going with the momentum of the flip while keeping this tight profile to the deck. Start from a setup with your body streamlined against the back deck, where it will present less drag underwater. By throwing your body into the setup, you start the rolling action immediately. The motion is like a sweep roll, starting from the back deck, sweeping to a forward position. Keep your elbows in tight to protect your shoulders. You might find that one side works more easily off the back face of the blade. This depends in part on your paddle offset angle. When you're upside down, try to minimize the water pressure on your blades so the paddle won't drag you out. The rodeo roll leaves you in a vulnerable position during the setup and your face and arms are not protected from anything underwater. The rodeo roll should only be used in deep water with proper technique to protect your shoulders. Now that back deck roll technique and that's pretty important because guys can get tweaked if they don't you know keep that that elbow down when they do that. And a lot of guys have gotten tweaked. wheel is a completely vertical move, initiated at 1 o'clock, slicing in towards 12, and the bow exiting at 6 o'clock, allowing the stern to slap in at 12 o'clock for two points. You already know the principles of this basic vertical cartwheel. By applying this understanding, you can analyze and learn just about any move. Figure out the path the end takes through the water, since this dictates the end in the air. Then work backwards to figure out what you need to control to make the move happen. Usually it's a combination of stroke, edge control, and body position that determines where you engage, load, and land. These variables create a spectrum of elevated spins partway between a 360 spin and a fully vertical cartwheel. If you go more than 45 degrees, it's commonly called a whippet. Less than 45, it's a McTwist. Let's look at the low angle McTwist, typically started near the sides of a hole. You control the elevation of the move by your edging and where you engage. Engage at 11 and take the bow towards 10. You'll get a similar move if you engage at 12 towards 1. This sometimes happens if you miss your aim for getting vertical. You'll use less attack angle on your edging than you would slicing in deep like you would for a cartwheel. It's the loading of the end that gives you a little elevation. These moves go with the current, so they don't load as much as when you go against the current. Early in the evolution of vertical moves was the Polish ender. The kayaker would paddle up in the hole and drive the bow in at an angle into the green water 
entering the kayak, and just before the kayaker would land upside down in the hole, he would reach for the foam pile with his paddle and his upper body, flicking the hips, and the boat would land side surfing into the hole upright. How do you make the polish happen? Imagine doing the standard vertical overshoot in thick syrupy molasses. Your intention might be to bring the end through the pile, but instead your boat goes past vertical, flying up and over you. Pirouette around, stroking off one side and finishing with a roll on the other side. The stern is lower volume and shorter. It slices and initiates easily, so there are lots of moves off the stern. Whatever can be done off the bow can be done off the stern, but there are some obstacles. For one, you can't see as easily to initiate. Secondly, leaning back and working backwards tends to impair your balance. If you engage an end at 1 and slice into the profile position at 12, what will you get? Big air, right? That is how you initiate this easy and dramatic move. It starts like a failed exit from the hole. Essentially, you fail to climb out to the release point of the hole. Instead of the end clearing water, catch your stern to engage it. You'll be on the power face of your blade, so it's easy to control. The boat tilt, the point of engagement with the green water, and the strokes will define exactly what sort of move you get. You can get the profile shape off either edge and blade. Squirt boaters call anything past vertical, where your body goes under the boat, a screw up. This name and definition is stuck with a wide variety of past vertical moves, usually off the stern, but sometimes off the bow. Most involve reaching through to combine with a partial roll or stroke to stay upright. If you go under the boat, or the boat goes over you, it's a screw up. Often this will wash you out of the hole. A split wheel starts off exactly like a cartwheel, slicing the bow in from 1 o'clock to vertical position at 12 and exiting at 6. But as the stern starts coming, slicing in for the next end, you switch edges of the kayak and it slices in on the opposite edge. The bow flies up ready for the next vertical move. Try to think of cartwheels and split wheels as vertical moves that start out similarly but differ in their degrees of rotation. In a split wheel, the same knee is engaged and the same blade does the work for both ends. This differs from cartwheels, which engage opposing knees and opposing blades for each ensuing end. Well, you've got the horizontal plane and you've got the vertical plane. You can flat spin in the hole, or ideally you'd be vertically cartwheeling in the hole. And between those two things, you've got an entire spectrum of angles. And what the bow is doing in the current determines what the stern is doing in the air. It's sort of angle in equals angle out. There's a lot of confusion on the names of rodeo moves because of almost infinite possibilities and many vague definitions. All of these moves happen pretty quickly, so just enjoy them. No learning stress, just fun. Work your set of stroke drills and balance so you can make more happen. Aggressive play paddling generates a lot of torque on your body. Warm up properly, use a boat sized for you, and consider using small blades and paddle shafts. There's no substitute for practice and study. Video yourself and your friends. Watch the video several times to develop your eye so you can identify your own mistakes. Visualize hitting lots of ends, be patient with your learning process, and most of all, have fun. Let's be real, you aren't going to learn these moves simply by watching a video. But with little practice with some of the tools we've shown you, you'll be hitting ends and shredding up waves like never before, thriving on the art of precision play paddling. <laughs>